Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Liberty Baptist Church for our evening service. We're glad you're with us. If you're a member, we're certainly glad you're with us. And we encourage you to tune in for all the services. We need each other's company. And for those who may be in other states, maybe other countries, we have several of those that usually watch. And we're so thankful that you're watching too. We want you to feel welcome to join in with us every time. We're glad you're here. On a mission trip to India one time, Brother Snyder and I and Brother Jim Brown, who's gone on to be with the Lord now, an evangelist, and we had a whole host of other preachers with us and other people. And uh, we had made it to, to India or the Philippines and we're on our way back and we're in a big airport on the other side of the world and, and we're all in the waiting area. And after a long wait, we're ready to ship out. We're finally ready to get our boarding passes and get on board and head back to the U.S. And we all went through. And so we're on our way up to the, to the uh, loading area. And all of a sudden, Brother Brown is hollering back there in the background. Hey, hey, wait. They don't have my boarding pass. They're not going to let me go. And Brother Sneather and being the calm, cool head that he is and never trying to fool around, he said, Brother Brown, it's too bad that you don't have a boarding pass. But just because one of us don't make it home doesn't mean that the rest of us ought to stay. We'll see you later. And so <laughs> we started walking away and finally we went back and told him we'd wait for him to get his boarding pass. And He's, he's half mad at us the rest of the evening, but he finally gets his boarding pass and we all make it home. But I just imagine in that particular moment when we were walking away and we all had boarding passes and he didn't, he's probably feeling like the loneliest guy in the world. He's on the other side of the world and we're going to be back in the States. Well, we're preaching tonight about, about the subject of loneliness. And I think this is a good time for us to be reminded of this. And we'll, we'll title the message, Coping with Loneliness. And we'll be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 9. And we're going to go all the way through verse 22. We'll just read three or four verses to start with to give us our start. And then we'll refer to the other verses as we go through. So let's read couple of verses to get us on our way. In coping with loneliness, this is quarantine time. We're kind of isolated and we need to be equipped to handle the loneliness that can invade our lives. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse number 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. The apostle Paul has been arrested. He's in quarantine himself, awaiting who knows what. He doesn't know. He thinks this may be the end of his life. And he's alone. And he's asking these questions to Timothy. He says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Now listen to the loneliness of Paul's voice as he says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Antichicus have I sent unto Ephesus now let's skip on down to verse number uh, 21 and then we'll pray. Verse 21, do thy diligence to come before winter. You sit, you, Eubulus greet, greeteth thee and Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. Let's pray together and talk about coping with loneliness tonight. Father, we come before you as we approach the throne of grace before we bring the message, asking you for your mercy and for your grace and for your power, 
for the fullness of the Holy Spirit as we present the message. And Lord, for the Spirit's effect upon our ears and upon our hearts, Lord, as we listen to the Spirit of God through the Word of God, Lord, be with us. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your death on the cross. We pray that your goodness would shine through the entire message, Lord, that you love us and you've made a way to approach us and to empower us and to strengthen us during times of loneliness as well as other times in our lives. We pray you'd bless us tonight in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You say, well, preacher, haven't you preached on this subject before? <laughs> oh, you've been listening. I'm glad to know that. <laughs> yes, I have preached on it before, just as I've preached on the cross before, but there are people out there who still need to hear the cross. And as the hymn goes, you know, we like to hear it again too. We never get hot tired of hearing about how Jesus died on the cross. So we preach that subject quite often. And I've preached on witnessing too, but there are still people who need to hear that they need to be a witness for God. And as long as there are people who are lost, we need to encourage Christians to be faithful witnesses. I've preached on the destructive nature of sin before. And yet we're prone to wander as was in the song service a little earlier. Lord, I'm prone to wander. Bind my wandering heart to thee. And we have a sinful nature. And just because we heard a sermon one time on sin doesn't mean that we're going to always be safe from following off in a wrong path. And so we preach on it fairly often. And I preached on the subject of church attendance before. Man, how we need to be together in the Lord's church. And even though we're in quarantine right now and we're isolated, the day is going to come. Believe me, it's coming when we'll get to come back into the house of God. We'll meet together with our brothers and sisters. And when we do, I hope everybody just flocks into this place. And those who hadn't really thought church attendance was important before, they'll be back and in greater numbers than ever before. So we just continue to preach on subjects like church attendance. One time doesn't do it. And we've preached on giving before how to be a giver, how to be generous, how to support the Lord's work and still needs are always there. Some people haven't, it just hadn't clicked with some people yet about they ought to tithe, they ought to give faith promise missions offering and they ought to be faithful just to be generous with God's people and with others in need all around. And so we, we keep preaching on giving because one message didn't do the job, right? I've heard... Uh, I was reading some documentation about the life of uh, Adrian Rogers. I think he was one of the greatest pulpiteers of, that I've ever heard. He had, a, he had a knack, a talent, a gift from God that he could take a passage of scripture and just lay it out so it looked so simple and you say, man, why didn't I see that? Look what it's saying. He was good at that and he could make it look simple and he could take the depths of scripture and he could give some meat to some old Christians that had been saved forever and they'd say, wow, look how deep he's going. So he put the cookies down on the lower shelf for the new Christians and he get, gave meat, I mean steak, for those who had been saved for a while. He had that knack. But you know, he preached on the same subjects pretty often. And as I read through these documents about his sermonizing, the great Adrian Rogers, I discovered, preached not only the same subjects over and over again, he preached the same sermons. He might change a title, he might change a point or two or an illustration or two, but he'd preach the same sermons and even to his own congregation. Maybe they heard it five years ago, but... People tend to forget new people come and need to hear it for the first time and we all need to be reminded. Isn't that true? And so, yes, I've preached on loneliness before. I have several sermons I've preached on it and you know what? Loneliness still creeps in. We're in this time of isolation, uh, virus quarantine, and it's so easy just to look over here and say, man, there used, to be, there used to be people in those seats right over there. 
There used to be people in those seats right over there. And even the preacher can look around the empty room and understand, yeah, there's people out there watching. They're watching the screen. They're watching the camera. But boy, a preacher can feel kind of lonely in a room all by himself, preaching to faces that he cannot see. We need to be reminded that we can become lonely and it can happen to all of us and it has. If you want to get some help from this sermon, first of all, pay close attention to every portion of it. Don't eat popcorn while you're watching me preach, amen? I'd be jealous. <laughs> pay attention. Write down some of these verse references because the life test, if it's not on you right now, the life test to see how you endure loneliness will come sooner or later and maybe time and again. So my design is to help you. I hope you get the help tonight. Well, at, at times, all of us have been overcome and overwhelmed by loneliness. It just happens. And <laughs> when God... In creation, on the sixth day of creation, God said in Genesis 1, 31, the first part, it says that God saw everything that he had made and it was very good. Man, God does everything well. But you know what? <laughs> the only thing that seemed lacking was there was not a man to fellowship with. And so he created a man. And then that man was a good man, good creation. But the man needed a wife. He needed a woman to fellowship with. And so God created a woman. And fellowship, escape from loneliness, is something that we all desire deep down inside. In this section that we've read about here in 2 Timothy, Paul is alone in a cold, damp, dungeon all alone and these are the last written words of the Apostle Paul that we can find and in this passage we find reasons for his loneliness and listen to this, a remedy for his loneliness and you and I can learn from the words of the great Apostle Paul how to discover what causes this and discover the remedy, the cure to how to overcome loneliness in our lives. You can see our backdrop and the loneliness of the landscape there. And we've designed some uh, a green screen so we can change the landscapes. And we're trying to do things different so that so that you can uh, see something that maybe piques your interest and and maybe we can just reach down into your soul and give you the word of God and. Maybe this backdrop helps you to see the desolation of the soul when we're, we're lonely. Notice first with me the reasons for loneliness. <clears throat> now we read the, the few verses there that we read in the beginning and you can see that the Apostle Paul's alone. And when you're alone for an extended period of time, it can become very depressing Paul was a people person, man. He loved to be around people. He's always gathering a crowd of people. He's preaching to people. He's witnessing to people. He's fellowshipping with the brethren. He, he loved people. Now he's all alone. Let's see some of the things that cause this loneliness for Paul. Number one is separation. Man, <laughs> he's separated from people. He separated from people in these verses. <clears throat> this quarantine we're under, man, we're, we're kind of separated. I mean, we've got better technology to communicate. We've got phones and we've got uh, internet and we've got social media and we can, we can kind of communicate that way and it's a lot better than being in a cold, damp, dark dungeon. But when people are not around, it's still a feeling of loneliness. And you know your quarantine is bad when, uh, when your dog turns its back on you. I, I go through a time, how for several years where I sit down in my, my chair in the living room when I first get up in the morning and I make, make me a cup of coffee and read the Bible and have my devotion time and, 
and just sit there and think, plan for my day for a little bit. And, and, uh, <coughs> and the dog is looking at me and kind of patiently waiting. The dog wants to see some action. <laughs> and the dog's not interested in my devotions. The dog's not even interested in my cup of coffee. And so when I finally move, when I finally get up and, and go get my socks and my shoes, and when I start putting my shoes on, my little dachshund comes running in there. She loves that shoe ceremony. That's what we call it. I invite her to come in and be involved in the, the shoe ceremony. We call it the putting on of the shoes, you know, kind of like the changing of the guard. Uh, we, we have the putting on of the shoes, and she always comes in there and joins me. Oh, during the quarantine, she came in the other day when it was time for me to put on my shoes and socks. Well, she came in there, and when she sat down, she just turned her back and stared away from me. She didn't even care. When the dog turns their back on you, you know you're in quarantine, and not only are you bored, the dog's even bored. And <laughs> you know your, your quarantine is getting bad when your wife, you know, in the past, your wife, when you get up and get ready and leave to go to work, and sometimes she might say, boy, I'm going to miss you today, or I wish you'd stay home with me. And now you, when you get up and act like you're going to the door, she said, oh, you're leaving? Good. Take your time. <laughs> and so you're, 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 you're knowing that your quarantine is getting bad when you find yourself talking to your phone instead of through your phone. I mean, I caught myself this morning saying to my phone, I had it plugged in the last few minutes before, before I came out to the church. And I, uh, I looked down at my phone and before I unplugged it, I said, are you charged up well enough yet? And, uh, well, who said that? I'm talking to my phone. <laughs> your quarantine will get to you. Well, Paul writes to Timothy and he says in verses nine and 11, <clears throat> he said, do thy thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Only Luke is with me. Loneliness occurs when we're separated from people, family, friends, workmates. We're separated. Separation causes loneliness. Being separated from our friends. Right now, I can only imagine <clears throat> the feeling of those high school seniors who worked all these years and they've, they've been dreaming about that graduation ceremony. They've been waiting for this special time and now we're in quarantine, we're isolated and, and many schools are not going to have a graduation ceremony and they're not going to get to walk across the platform and receive their diploma in front of their family and it's been waiting all these years and their friends cheering them on. The crowd won't be there. College graduates worked hard. They put in the time. They put in the study. They took the test. They wrote the papers. And now they're not going to get to walk across that platform in many places. Parents watch their kids grow up. And now they're not going to get to see this last hoorah before they move away from home. They just sit in isolation and miss that event. Workers furloughed from their jobs. Not only are they missing out on some income, they're, <laughs> they're missing their fellow workers that maybe they've made friends with and that's on hold and we're isolated. We're separated. And other workers who are deemed essential workers, they're going on to work and they're looking back and saying, man, here I am all alone going to work and all those rascals are sitting back there at home enjoying themselves, <laughs> eating popcorn and hot dogs and watching TV and they're getting their stimulus check and I got to go to work. And so they feel alone. Grandparents are isolated from their grandchildren and, and the grandchildren and the grandparents are missing that time because they're in many cases separated right now. I can think of hundreds of other situations like that, probably some that you could mention. Isolation, separation, man, it just makes you susceptible to loneliness. One of the most difficult times of separation can be maybe at the death of a spouse. And in some areas of our country, there's been deaths of people during this quarantine and isolation. Some states have way more restrictions than we do. And in some places, loved ones are not even able to go to the graveside or to the funeral home or to the church for a funeral service with their friends who would normally comfort them. It's a time of separation. 
Erica's mom, our piano player, my daughter-in-law, Aaron's wife, her mother was killed several years ago. Tomorrow is the anniversary of her death. And I know she feels the pangs from this every year when this day rolls around, feeling isolated, separated from her mom for a long, long time. And people are just feeling separated all over. We go through times of loneliness and, and we don't have people near us like we usually do to comfort us in times when things seem bad. Some people are suffering financially right now. Some people are suffering with their health. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 it says, Wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another. And in many cases, we don't have a lot of un-and-others around to comfort us at this particular time. Separation can cause loneliness. Desertion can cause, cause loneliness. And in verse number 10, it says, Paul said, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Here's Paul. Here's the great apostle Paul. Man, he's preached, he's traveled, he's promoted the Lord. He's planted churches. He's been everywhere in crowds and he has been a friend to preachers all over the place. He's nurtured them and helped them and Demas was one of them and now he says, Demas hath forsaken me. Boy, being deserted can cause loneliness and you feel like you're in a desert of desolation because somebody deserted you. It could have been a spouse who was unfaithful. It could have been a spouse who, who divorced you and you had no choice. It could be some family member or some friend who got mad over seemingly nothing and just walked out. And now you're deserted. Boy, desertion, it can even hurt sometimes more than sep just other types of separation. Desertion, that feeling of betrayal. Somebody was loyal and then they stopped being loyal. Desertion. Paul also writes in verse 14 and he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. We don't know what exactly happened there. It could be that Alexander had informed on Paul and, and got him in trouble and uh, he could be the cause of his arrest, but he's been, he has been betrayed, deserted. Paul writes in verse 16, the first part of our text, and he says, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Oh, what a horrible feeling. He was forsaken. He's been deserted. Maybe something like that has happened to you. And, and in these times of isolation and quarantine, maybe you are reminded of someone who deserted you. Maybe it's been recently. Maybe it's been a while back, but those things come back to you. There's hundreds of pastors all across the land right now who are not only feeling separated from their flocks, but some feel other types of desertion not just separation. They've got some faithful members who are going to stay loyal through this thing, but maybe some desert their pastor and their church. Some will, some people that used to come to church during this time of isolation and quarantine, some, some of those people that were under the, the shadow of protection and destruction of their pastor now, because of this, they've taken the opportunity to go back into sin. Some are going back to alcohol. Some are going back to drugs. It's a sad thing when abortion clinics and liquor stores and marijuana stores are open and churches are closed and a pastor can't minister to those. There's even uh, these uh, self-help programs and church programs that, are, that were designed to help addicts Alcohol, alcoholics and drug addicts to help them and now they're, they're back in the world because we're isolated, separated and now those have deserted their pastor. Maybe some during this time of absence will 
decide just to not go back to church anymore because after all, I can watch church online, right? We're doing it now, so why not just keep doing it when church building opens back up? We won't go back. We'll just watch online. I'm glad we've got the technology, especially during a time like this where we can watch online. But watching online is not a replacement for the assembling of yourselves together. And so I hope nobody that I know decides just to say, well, we'll watch it online sometimes and we don't have to go to church anymore. That is not assembling together. This is the best substitute we have right now. But I, I know some are going to desert their pastors across the land during this time. It's an opportunity for them just to change their way of worship. We'll do it without actually going to church. Some will desert their pastor, desert their church during this time in other churches across the land. There'll be some who will say, you know, I've been wanting to try out some other churches anyway, and our church is just having online preaching, Facebook Live or YouTube or on their website, and so our church is not really gathering anybody together, so we're going to go over and visit XYZ Church that's having a drive-in service on the parking lot. That'll be more exciting. And then they'll drift towards that church never to return. And a pastor can feel deserted. See, a pastor goes through this every time somebody leaves. When somebody leaves the church, they may feel loneliness that, for that one time when they leave, but a pastor has to go through it every time every individual leaves. Some people will go and find a new church during this time because they have the opportunity. Friends have invited them to come and be part of their church, and so the sheep stealing goes on during this time, and, and some churches will say, hey, come on over to us. Maybe some friends at another church, come on over and go with us. And some will leave and desert their brethren for no good reason. There was no immorality. There was no heresy. They just wanted something new. Desertion. But the Apostle Paul kept a good attitude about this. In the last part of verse 16 in our text, Paul said, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. <laughs> hey, Paul said, yeah, some people have deserted me. And it makes me feel alone, lonely and so, you know, I feel lonesome about it. But Lord, don't lay it to their charge. Paul had a good attitude, didn't he? Paul didn't carry a, a grudge against those people. Now, some pastors may say, man, I lost this couple over here. Man, I'm glad they're gone. <laughs> well, that doesn't happen very often around here that we're glad somebody's gone. When you've been deserted or betrayed, you feel lonely. Well, some of our deepest hurts are caused by people who deserted us. Separation causes loneliness. Desertion causes loneliness. Even Jesus knew what it was like to be separated from his home in heaven for 33 years. He knew what it was like to be deserted by people like Judas. But what did Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I'm saying whether you understand why someone is going through the blues or not, we ought to feel certain that they feel pain. Whether they have a good reason to feel lonely or not, if they're feeling the pain of the loneliness, we ought to have some compassion on them. So there's two broad categories of loneliness and separation. This loneliness that comes because of separation and desertion. Now let's look at the rem remedies. This gets better, okay? We saw the, the reasons why people may feel lonely. But now let's look at the remedy. That's what we want to get to, right? The doctor can tell you what disease is wrong with you and tell you what caused it, but he doesn't send you away. He tries to give you a remedy. And so Paul here is going to show us a remedy for the loneliness that you might feel in your soul, that feeling of desolation. 
First of all, the remedy that I see in Paul here is he needs God's people. He's saying, <clears throat> Luke is here with me. Thank God for old faithful Luke. Bring Mark. I need God's people to be around me. Bring old Mark. He's profitable. And so we need God's people. One of the best remedies for loneliness is to know that you need God's people. There are many people out there that will lead you in the wrong direction, away from God, but God's people will embrace you with the love of God and bring you in. Friend, if you're lonely, you need the people of God. One of the ways that we can kind of edify one another, build each other up, I know several of you are watching the singing before the preaching at every service and several of you comment on there and you like it and put a heart, uh, heart emoji on there. You love the singing. Well, that's good. That shows that you are communicating. And as God's people, we need to do that. That's one of the ways. I mean, some people might not be accustomed to a lot of interaction on social media like Facebook. But hey, if, if a song touches your heart, if this draws you closer to the Lord, if you enjoy the sound of the music and the singing, go ahead and click something on there that you like it or you love it or comment and say, amen, that was good. I love that song. And a lot of you are doing that. More of you need to. Get involved with God's people during the preaching. You may have a preacher that's not a very good one. I wish I could preach like Adrian Rogers. I wish I could preach like a number of other preachers who have become very well-known pulpiteers. <laughs> but hey, you're stuck with me. But you know what you can do? You can, you can embrace the preaching of the Word of God regardless of who's bringing the Word of God. And so if you click a like, you click an amen, you just say hallelujah, praise the Lord. Man, if the Word of God does something for you, if it excites you, then let us know on here. That let us, lets us know you're watching and that encourages us. We need a little encouragement too. And, and when you interact on the social media, during these online services of preaching and singing, when you interact, that encourages your brothers and your sisters out there, and they don't feel like they're on there alone. Some of them tag you from time to time on there just to see where you are. Well, say something so they know you're there. As the old saying goes, if you see something, say something. And that way we embrace each other at this particular time of isolation and separation and we can bring our hearts together by a little bit of interaction during these online services. Proverbs 17, 17, the first part of that verse says, you know it, you probably got it memorized. A friend loveth at all times. And that means when things are going well and when things are not going so well. That means when times are prosperous and when times are not so prosperous. That means when we're meeting together in the church and that means when we're not meeting together in church. We're still friends and a friend loveth at all times. Hallelujah. We got to love each other, friend. Let's stay connected. <clears throat> In this passage, Paul mentions many of his real friends. He mentions Crescens there in verse number 10. And uh, he's known as a faithful man. Man, he's, he's a guy, Crescens is a man. His name never appears in a church bulletin. His name is never mentioned from the pulpit. His name is never mentioned on a list of people who are doing certain things in the church. But he's just a faithful man. He's there. And he carries out his service to God maybe in ways that are never in the spotlight. But Paul saw fit to mention the name of Crescens. We don't know much about him. He may have been kind of like some of us, just a little bit of a wallflower. But thank God he was faithful. He mentions... <laughs> Uh, in Mark chapter 9, verse 41, the Bible mentions this. It says, whosoever gives you a cup of cold water shall not lose his reward. No matter how little things you do in the service of God, you're important 
and you make a difference and you'll never lose the reward because of it. Keep on doing the little things. You don't have to be known as a great person. You don't have to be famous, but you can be faithful even in the little things and you don't lose your reward. Paul mentions the name of Titus. In uh, verse number 10, he mentions Titus there. Titus was an associate of his and Titus had carried some letters for him and it says that he and, he and Crescens now are, are gone. Maybe, uh, maybe they're, they're, they're probably carrying on some missionary work and so they're doing some things and Paul's got some real friends here but he's isolated from them. A third friend that's mentioned there is Luke in verse number 11 of our text. Luke is mentioned and Luke is with him. Luke was known as the beloved physician. Maybe he's there just to take care of Paul's physical needs. Uh, Luke wrote the book of Acts and when he wrote the book of Acts and told all the things that Paul was doing all over Asia Minor, churches that he's planting, souls that he's winning, sermons that he's preaching, things that he's done for God. Luke never mentions his own name. He just talks about Paul and the others. <coughs> I like Luke. That's why I'm preaching through the gospel of Luke on Sunday mornings. I love Luke. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> the remedy for loneliness, one of them is having people, friends. <clears throat> friend loveth at all times. Man, we ought to try to be a friend to the people that we can. If we'll be a friend, we'll have friends. Later on, in verse number 11, <clears throat> Paul says, take Mark and bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry. There's old Mark. Mark had failed one time on a mission trip. Mark turned around and went back. He left the field. And so here's Paul left without Mark at one point. But Paul later on reevaluates Mark's ministry and Mark's life. And now he says, bring him. And so Paul's not a, not a grudge holder against Mark. And boy, Mark was profitable. Paul wanted him. And so some of the people, thank God for people getting second chances, right? And Mark's one of those guys who got a second chance and it paid off. And we ought to be willing to give a few people second chances, don't you think? Our fellow brothers and sisters may stumble or fall in their walk with Christ Boy, that's when it's good to have somebody that cares and loves you. A friend loveth at all times and will help. What, what does the Bible say in Galatians chapter 6? It says, brethren, in Galatians 6, 1, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Sound like Paul did that. We've got friends out there that may need to be embraced once again. Show them that we love them. Show them that we've forgiven them and let's see if we can move forward together. Boy, one of the great ways to restore a confident heart that's been lonely is to reach out to the people of God. Old Tychicus, he's mentioned there, a fifth friend that Paul mentions. Uh, he wasn't a preacher or a teacher, but he used the, the gifts that God gave him. He was Profitable also. We need God's people. So the remedy, how to deal with loneliness, coping with loneliness, coping with loneliness, that's the title we gave to the message, coping with it. And so that's what we're talking about right here. We need God's people. And secondly, we need God's purpose. We need God's people and we need God's purpose. Apparently Paul's arrest was so sudden he didn't get to gather up his belongings and take with him to the prison. And so he says in verse 13, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee. He needs his cloak. It's probably cold in that old dungeon. He didn't even have, it, have his coat with him. And so he tells Timothy, when you come, bring my coat. And he said, another thing, he said, bring the books and the parchments. What Paul's purpose included 
the word of God. And he never forgot that purpose that the Lord Jesus appointed to him on that Damascus road that day. And so Paul said, man, I'm locked up here. I'm isolated, but I need to carry on God's purpose. God's got a purpose for me. And as long as I'm breathing, I'm going to keep on going for the Lord. Bring the books, bring the Bible, bring the scriptures, bring the scrolls. I'm going to keep on going for God. I'm not giving up. And he was close to his death, but he wasn't ready to give up. God's purpose always includes us using our talents and our gifts and our circumstances to help others. One of the best ways to get out of the doldrums, one of the best ways to, to revive from this feeling of loneliness instead of sitting in the desert and licking our wounds, we ought to be seeing what we can do to help somebody else. Aaron and Erica took around some gifts and gave to some people. I thought that was just terrific. I've had people to do some of those things for me. Man, old Lloyd Smith fixed me up with a part that I couldn't buy anywhere yesterday. That's one of the smartest men I know. <laughs> I, don't tell him I said that. He'll get the big head. <laughs> he doesn't want the title of being smart, but that man knows something. I got to go through, uh, through his shop yesterday and got to tour his shop. Man, he's got machines in there that, I mean, it'll slice pieces of steel as thick as your hand, chop it off like a slice of bologna. He's got things that can, can shape and mold and weld and drill steel like I've never seen before. He made it a part for my little lawnmower to hook up to a trailer. <laughs> and man, I was amazed how nice it looked when he got through. I tried to tell him what I wanted and I guess I didn't express it very good, but he figured it out and he put it together and it worked. I appreciate that, Brother Lloyd. The loneliest people in the world are those who just think about themselves. And to get out of this feeling of loneliness, we need to do what we can to find others who have needs and get our mind off of ourselves, stop licking our wounds and help somebody else. Does that make sense? Paul wasn't selfish. He wanted the preaching to go on to the Gentiles. He said in, in verse number 17 that by me the preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear. Here's Paul in prison instead of saying, oh, woe is me. He's lonely and he's missing his friends. But he said, man, there's Gentiles out there that need to hear the word of God. And when I preach to an empty room, I like to point over here and, and remember where Joe Stewart sat in our auditorium. I like to point over here and, and point to where Jesus Jimmy and Brenda sat. And I like to point on the back row where all you backsliders sit. <laughs> I got to get in a little jab once in a while. But it's an empty room. But I got to keep on preaching. That's what God called me to do. And you need to keep doing things for other people that gets your mind off of you. It'll help your loneliness. It's not so much for the benefit of others as it helps you too. Paul never forgot God's purpose for his life. Not only the purpose, God's purpose, but God's presence. The third thing we need to overcome the loneliness, to cope with loneliness, we need God's presence. He can do for us what nobody else can do. He writes, Paul writes, in verses 17 and 18 in our text, Paul writes, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. In Paul's loneliness, in his desolation, in his hour of need, when everybody else had fled except for Luke the doctor, Paul's saying, I'm all alone. Nevertheless, the Lord stood with me, strengthening me. You hear that? Strengthening me. You need strength. This is a time of weakness when we feel lonely and the Lord is the one who can give you real strength. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's who we need. We know 
that the Lord's going to be with us. We know that, but sometimes we forget it. Let me remind you of Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse number 8. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. <laughs> I like that. Man, that's a good verse. Write that down, write it down. Deuteronomy 31, 8. Some of you might want to make that your life's verse. Say, man, this verse brought me out of the quarantine. It saved me in this time of isolation. I learned that God was with me and that he would strengthen me and there's nothing that I have to fear. Loneliness is an excellent time to get really well acquainted with God. I don't know why the virus came and why the whole world is shut down. I don't know why. Some say it's a political maneuver. I think politics are involved at least as a result of it, maybe not the cause of it. And that might have had something to do with it too, maybe over in China. <laughs> but whether it was just a natural disaster that nobody could avoid. Some people think it's a conspiracy. Some people think that this is something that our government's trying to use to bring us under socialism. And all of these things may have some elements of truth to them. But one thing I know is that in times like this, regardless of what caused it and regardless of who's abusing it and using it, I know that being in a time like this, it just may be that the silver lining is that God is invading my soul and getting closer to me. I hope he's getting closer to you. Or should I say, you getting closer to him. We need times of being alone with God. And if we're going to get to know him intimately, we'll have to be alone. <coughs> the Lord Jesus, even when he walked this earth in Mark 135, it says, and in the morning, rising up a, a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Oh, listen, the Lord Jesus needed, he needed to communicate with the Father he needed to develop a closeness with the Father. And if he wanted to do that, how much more should you and I let times of loneliness and isolation draw us closer to the one who loves us? Well, I need to hasten on. I think I probably went a little longer than I intended to. So I'll, I'll stop preaching right here if you'll do what I've preached. Did you write some verses down? You're going to remember that? You're going to go back and watch this video again and say, I'm going to overcome my loneliness. I'll go back through and see what that nutty preacher said. If he quoted some Bible, maybe, that, maybe I can get some truth there. I hope it's been a help, seriously. These times can be trying on our nerves. It can be stressful. It can isolate us to the point of loneliness. Some of you may not have the Lord Jesus as your Savior. You need Him. If you're without the Lord as your Savior in a time like this, where is hope? You need Him. He loves you and wants to save you. He died on the cross for you. He died for your sins so your sins could be forgiven and fellowship and relationship could be restored. You could be at one with God again, but you need your sins forgiven. And only Jesus, his death on the cross, pay for those sins. You can't do it on your own, as we said this morning in the message. Your works, your deeds, won't count for your salvation. After you get saved, you ought to have good deeds. You ought to have good works. You ought to follow the Lord in baptism after you get saved. You ought to go to church and pray and read your Bible after you get saved. But none of that will make you saved. You need a Savior. 
for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And he'll save you, my friend, if you'll just let him. Won't you ask him for his grace and his mercy today? You can say something like this. My prayer won't save you, but if you mean, mean it from your heart when you ask him, you can say something like this. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I don't deserve to go to heaven, but I sure don't want to go to hell. Lord, I believe you died for me. Would you please save me right now? I trust your blood on the cross as full payment for my sins. If you'd ask him for salvation, he would surely give it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, he loves you, friend. Why don't you get saved right now? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Thank you for the passage of Scripture demonstrating that Paul was just, he was a human. He had friends, but he was lonely. He had done some great things, but now he's isolated. But he knew to ask you to be his comfort in that time of isolation. Lord, I pray that you'd bless us tonight as we find comfort in our isolation. And we look forward for the day when we can be released from these things. And Lord, we think it'll be soon when we're released from the quarantine and we can just get back to doing the things that we need to do. Lord, for those who are not saved, I pray that I ask you right now to save them and to mean it. There's no magic in the words. And Lord, I want them to know that. I pray that you'd show them that they'll just simply put their trust in you from the heart. They can be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, <laughs> I need to remind you of a couple of things. Um, first of all, this is time when we normally have our offering. We can't do that now, of course, but we do have giving online, lbccircy.com, and you see it on your screen all the time, and you can mail it in or call us, send it by carrier pigeon or whatever. And uh, we, we need to remind you that... <clears throat> that one of the ways to overcome loneliness is to utilize the ability to go online and watch your church services. Be bound together with your brothers and sisters in Christ on Facebook, YouTube, church website, your church, your church, Liberty Baptist Church. Stay connected and that will help fight off the loneliness. And just check out our website every day at lbccircy.com and We'll, we'll, we'll be meeting back here pretty soon. The governor, I think, said he was expecting some things in the first phase to open up uh, May 4th. Uh, I don't know. We'll just keep a monitor on that and see how it works out. I'm really hoping we can certainly be in here by Mother's Day and celebrate uh, our mothers together here. And for the ones who are vulnerable, maybe more susceptible to the diseases, uh, if, if you want to celebrate from home and watch us, well, we understand. Nobody's going to try to shame you for that. I don't blame you. Uh, no, nobody wants to catch this stuff, this virus or the flu or anything else. And so, but a few of us might gather together and uh, maybe from Mother's Day on, maybe even a week before. We'll just have to see about that. We'll keep you informed on here. Uh, there's, there's some information on screen about Chuck Harding's uh, National Prayer conference that he has. Brother Harding called me a couple days ago and asked me if I would pray, uh, be one of the five preachers who prays. And this goes out all over the nation, all over the United States, even to some foreign lands. And we have a national prayer conference call. And I was honored that he asked me to do that. He's had some, he's had preachers from all over the nations on there. And he even had Ted Cruz's daddy on there praying the other night. So Chuck knows a bunch of people up there in Washington, D.C. And we really appreciate what he does in trying to get the Bible principles into our nation's government and working with them, praying with them, meeting their needs. We appreciate all that he does. If you'd like to get on that, he told me to specifically ask you if you would join in on the national prayer line. It comes on at our time, uh, 7.30 each night, except for Sunday night. And you can call in and you can listen in. You'll be muted so your voice won't hear. And kids or the dogs are barking in the background. Nobody will hear. You'll be muted. But you can listen in as Brother Harding uh, has people to pray on there. And so... We'll, we'll be doing some other things to, uh, to keep 
our people engaged with the church. And so I just want you to know that I love you and I'm looking forward to us meeting together again. If you have any need, please call me. If you don't have my number, call somebody, a friend, a member of the church and get my number from them and you can call me whenever you need to and I'll help any way I can. I just want to stay in contact with you. And so for now, we have to tie so long until we meet again. We're going to meet again on Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. And you can, after we pray, well, we already prayed, didn't we? Uh, we just tie so long, and you can go back to eating your popcorn again now. Uh, you can go back to your regularly scheduled eating as we dismiss. God bless you, my friends. Goodbye. So long. See you Wednesday.